Hey, good evening, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, tonight's webinar is on navigating the complexities of a hybrid work environment. My name is Samira Ahmed, and I'm the CEO of Pinnacle Human Capital. It's my absolute privilege to be hosting this webinar over the next two days on behalf of Regent Business School. The sessions over the next two days will explore the evolution of the workplace, um, business, as we know, have continued to adjust to workplace changes in response to the pandemic and an evolving global economy. And over the next two days, these sessions will unpack its complexities and offer you tools and solutions to guide, support, and help you thrive in the new world of work. Before I hand over to our esteemed panelists, there's just a few logistical mentions. For those of you that are unfamiliar with Zoom, you will see in the Q&A and chat functionality in your taskbar. Please feel free to pop any questions into the Q&A box and we'll answer them throughout the session. Questions that we are unable to answer tonight will be answered tomorrow in our live Q&A with various industry experts. So look out for that. We'd also love to know what your key learning and insights are throughout the session. So you may use the chat functionality for this. Um, to all of the region students who are in attendance this evening, um, those of you that attend both days of the MDP program, you will become eligible to receive a certificate of attendance. Um, this will add immense value on your CV when you tackle the job market. Regent um, has streamlined the certification process in keeping with technological advances in the workplace, so you no longer need to submit your ID copy. Instead, Regent will only need your student number. So if you didn't include your student number when registering for this webinar, um, just email your details to shaquille.mohammed at regent.ac.za. Um, the details can be found in the comments section. Students who are um, eligible for a certificate of attendance will receive a notification within a week via your Regent email address with instructions on how to download that certificate. So please ensure that you've activated your Regent email address. With that said, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists for this evening. We have Kyle Chetty and Tafadzwa Mukaredzi. Kyle has over 10 years experience in the HR industry. He's currently an HR executive and certified Gallup coach. Kyle recently won the Young CHRO of the Year Award for 2020 and was a finalist for the Future of HR Awards for HR Director of the Year and Best HR Strategy. People Hum has named him one of the top most uh, 100 most inspirational leaders of 2021. Tafadzwa, or Taffy as he's more affectionately known, has over 15 years of leadership experience in the manufacturing, consulting, and technology sectors. He is qualified industrial engineer and holds an MBA. He's currently completing his research for an MCOM in information systems and technology. In his current role, Taffy is responsible for guiding the technological transition into the digital era as the company is propelled into the fourth industrial revolution. With that said, Kyle, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Samir, for that introdu introduction and welcome to every single one of you. It's really great to have you part of this MDP program. Um, I am going to share my screen with you. So if you can just let me know that you can see it in the chat functionality, that will be great. Uh, what I am going to do is I am going to turn off my video uh, due to the bandwidth. Um, so I'll turn it back on later on, but just for the purposes of me presenting, I'm going to turn it off so you'll be able to see the presentation better. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So what we do know is that during the pandemic, organizations rallied quickly to really virtualize um, sort of this design to remain productive remotely. And some leaders still believe things will revert, but the pandemic demonstrated that many of our work assumptions are archaic and unnecessarily limiting. And now we are basically begging for reinvention. And the pandemic forced companies to quickly adopt remote work as an integral part of their business continuity strategy. The global crisis accelerated the adoption of these work tools and practices in an unprecedented way. And by April 2020, about half of companies reported that more than 80% of the employees worked from home because of COVID-19. Now, that shift was made possible by decades of research into and then the development of technologies that support remote work. But not everyone uses technologies with the same ease. We're all learning as we go. But what, what we know, there are two things for sure. 
Flexible work is here to stay and the talent landscape has fundamentally shifted. Remote work has created new job opportunities for some, offered more family time and provided options for whether or not to commute. But there's also challenges that lies ahead. Teams have become more soiled and this year, digital exhaustion is a real and unstable threat. And with that being said, I'm really excited that if you can stay up until tomorrow, we have, uh, as Samira mentioned, we've got some uh, esteemed panelists that will be joining us that will be sharing some of their experiences through this. So please look out for that. The reality is that the hybrid workforce strategies are here to stay, whether we like it or not. Managers who reimagine where, when, and by whom work gets done are now in a better position to generate both business outcomes as well as talent outcomes. So it's really a win-win for organizations and employees. But first, you have to pick the journey forward, meaning what other options do we have to move forward? Well, option one is we reject the hybrid model and we force a return to the traditional location-centric model and work schedule. This is our Monday to Friday, eight to five, and sometimes maybe working shifts. This incurs the risk of employees leaving for more flexibility elsewhere. And we won't want to share the Kodak story of how they refused to innovate where they needed to. Option two is around accept the hybrid environment, but decline to evolve to the work model. This is about to continue virtualizing um, sort of site-centric practices such as meetings and so forth, as they were during the pandemic. But this incurs the risk of exacerbating worker fatigue. Option three is that we reinvent work around a human-centric design a new hybrid environment that ensures performance, innovation, and equity. And getting it right requires um, experimentation, learning, and training. Now, it became abundantly clear that employees could just as product it could be just as productive as when they were in the office, and sometimes even more productive when they're at home. But with that productivity, we see things like video fatigue, bandwidth issues, uh, blurred lines between work and home lives, and these things are increasing burnout as we see it. We are entering the golden age of worker. And with a human-centric focus, companies need to rethink how they shape work patterns, while the new ways of working um, need to be adapted and reinvented to meet employee preferences. Um, one in three employees are asking for renewed collaboration practices, less dense work environment, and digital interactions where possible. So as managers, we need to consider some of these opportunities. We need to prioritize human health and wellness and evolve their mobility program to enable work from anywhere. Um, reimagine the future of work post COVID-19 and start building scenarios towards 2025. We need to start exploring the hybrid workplace mobility for greater future resiliency. Consider global real estate portfolio transformation strategies with a liquid footprint to meet a dispensed workforce and to accelerate workplace trans uh, technology transformation and investments to enable a digital workforce. Now, the opportunity to reimagine the future of work has never been stronger than it is now. And companies really need to explore solutions that fit and flex with their organizations best. Particularly with the hybrid work model combined with a remote first and digital first approach, we can see that enterprises should start focusing this way to encourage uh, transformation and leading their own resiliency in the workplace. Now, accepting that they may never once operate again as we did in pre-crisis, many organizations need to realize the ability to adapt to new and changing conditions that will be essential for success in the future. Now, there's no roadmap to follow. Instead, we need to navigate the future of work with the agility to adapt to changes throughout 2021, 2022, and beyond. This is no mean feat, and there are sort of considerable targets that we need to look at. So we need to look at how do we enable, uh, enable hybrid work? How do we empower and engage employees where, where, wherever they work? And how do we manage and sustain on-demand occupancy planning? Now, the trend is that hybrid work ecosystems will start increasing rapidly. And there's a prediction that by 2025, 
we will start be um, so we will be having more sort of characterized work uh, spaces, more digitally enabled, more liquid, and we will it will not be the same, but it will be something that we do and we encourage therefore, and. Going back to the work model that prevailed before the pandemic, it's sort of a step backwards. And as our organizations um, go for don't want to improve, uh, it's it's basically we're not going to be resilient without it. So strategies like the hybrid workforce models start by dispelling the myths that stand between us and the ability to capture this competitive opportunity. We then need to pursue a strategy in which we experiment, learn, and sort of train in terms of the implementation across these fonts to make hybrid working a win-win for your employees and the organizations that we have. And with that being said, I am now going to hand you over to Taffy. Thank you so much, Kyle, um, for that uh, wonderful intro into um, what the new workplace will look like. Thank you also, Samira, for the um, uh, very good introduction. And also thanks to Regent uh, Business School. I would like to also thank all you guys who have managed to join. I know um, with the load shedding, it could have been disruptive. What I'm also going to do is I'm also going to switch off my um, camera as I go through the next few slides where I'm just going to try and unpack a few of the trends that we're seeing um, taking place that are impacting on um, what's happening in the workspace. Um, so if you'll excuse me, I'll just switch off my camera and share my presentation with you. Right, so I think as Carl has unpacked um, what has happened over the last, uh, we'll call it two years with the pandemic has seen a lot of changes forced upon businesses. Um, and this has led to uh, some businesses adopting faster than others. What we are seeing is uh, a couple of trends. Um, that are taking place in the in the in the workspace, and these can be grouped into uh, technology, which is the digitization of all areas of life, automation and robotization, the technosocial, which touches on globalization and environmentalization, the social, which deals with the demographic changes that we're seeing in the workplace, um, and the formation of a network society. And then there's obviously the meta trend where technology is now assisting in the acceleration of the changes in the workplace. I will unpack um, these ones uh, in turn. So the digitalization of all areas of life um, has been brought about uh, mainly because uh, the amount of data that is available um, is growing. The internet is becoming more accessible and digitalization technologies are mastering new areas of human um, activities. And this again has led to a lot more automa automation and robotization in the workspace. And um, what we will see is the development of autonomous systems that are capable of complex physical and cognitive activities, which will transform the, hum the, the role of human labor in all sectors of the economy. And I think put simply, what this means is that we're going to be seeing more and more um, of the mundane uh, tasks that have been performed by human beings being taken over by um, uh, robots or machines. On the social side, um, the demographic changes that we're seeing, there's, there's, there's more diversity in the, in, in the workplace, um, life expectancy, um, has increased, is increasing, and will continue to increase. Um, and the rate of rural urban migration will continue um, to go up. And um, I think this can be particularly seen with the growing role of 
women in the economy and the changing model of childhood. Um, and this will determine a new social landscape. And um, what I would want to share with you as well is um, this phenomenon that's called the, the, the network society. Now, the emergence of new and more flexible ways of managing companies and communities is supplemented with the development of network technologies and the expansion of solutions based on um, a number of, of, of technologies that we are seeing. So there's blockchain technology. We are also seeing the internet of things and so on. Um, the meta trend uh, is a phenomenon, again, that will see the acceleration of all the listed changes that I've spoken about up there. Um, and this will increase at a particularly rapid pace. A new technological solutions and social practices will begin to emerge at an increasingly rapid pace. This meta trend not only influences specific changes, but also sets the rate of world renovation, a rate that the majority of existing social institutions are not ready for. And um, I think we will all agree that uh, when we were forced into the hard lockdown last year in March, there were very few businesses that were equipped to be able to deal with such a um, black swan event, such a, such a disruptive event of such magnitude, and it impacted um, all sectors of the economy. So we need to also understand what we, what, what is, what has happened to the techno-social side of, um, uh, of our lives. Uh, globalization, which was a very topical issue, and still is, I think, to, to a great degree, um, particularly in academia and the impact of globalization on world trade, um, and how value chains, consumer goods, scientific knowledge, and cultural codes emerge and exist in an ultra-connected world, where the role of transnational cooperation intensifies. This is also closely followed by the growing consumer and manufacturer tension towards environmental well-being um, and is accompanied by the transformation of the very concept of environmental friendliness. I think climate change uh, is becoming more and more topical, particularly with the younger generation that is coming into the workspace that wants to understand what their role is in terms of preserving the world that we live in. We realize that in different countries, the influence of these trends will be received differently. Um, some will adopt faster than others. In some places, it is already visible in the majority of sectors of the economy, while in others, the deferred effect will be observed. But even being contained, these changes sooner or later are going to significantly affect each individual, um, regardless of their physical location and form. Um, and form the economic and social pattern of the 21st century. So what are we going to, what are we starting to see? Now, there is talk about how connected everything is. And um, this has been brought about by the exponential growth of the internet, right? And um, the scope of the digitalization trend. And uh, there was an article um, that was written um, based on Cisco's estimation that by 2021, the global annual internet traffic will grow 127 times compared to two, 2005 and reach 3.3 zettabytes. At the same time, due to the development of machine-to-machine -machine communications or the internet of things, 10 billion new devices will appear in the world's IP networks meaning for each inhabitant of the earth, there will be 3.4, roughly um, 3.4 devices connected to the networks. So what does, this, what does this mean for all of us? So remember this is being driven by the emergence of computers and subsequently technology unifying them into networks. Uh, and this has become one of the most important technological breakthroughs of humanity. The internet is no longer just a network of computers. It is a network of all kinds of devices from a cell phone and smartwatch to cars, traffic lights, um, robots, transport, transport drones, and automated industrial machines. 
the internet is becoming the network of everything. Uh, it, and you see it in everyday life. Um, I remember a couple of days ago, uh, just literally my jaw dropping when I walked into a shop and I was standing behind this gentleman and he paid for his groceries using his watch. I hadn't seen it before. And um, it just brought home the reality that everything is now connected. His, his watch is connected. His watch was connected to his phone, which was connected to his bank. And he was now able to transact seamlessly um, as he was doing um, his shopping. So what does this really mean for, um, for everybody and for breaks of business? So what we need to also unpack at this juncture is the concept of big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And all three of these are connected because one, uh, it all starts from the amount of data that is uh, available to us, which has to then be interpreted and um, delivered as information to, to its users. So the industrial and household computerization uh, has led to this area of big data. This in turn opens up new opportunities for the development of artificial intelligence, um, artificial intelligence technology, implying that the ability of computing devices to solve complex problems independently. So what is happening essentially is that there's massive amounts of data that is available, which only um, technology with huge processing power can, can cope with. However, if it's just pushing through that data without being able to learn and understand and find patterns with what is happening with that data, that data is useless. So the continuous growth of computer productivity and the development of machine learning technology has made it possible for huge flows of quantized data to become the material for artificial neural network learning. They are already actively used as recommendation systems for making decisions in finance, medicine, education, and other fields. You will also see that there's another trend that is coming, which is the virtual reality technology. And another, a crucial aspect of digitalization is a gradual superstructure of normal reality with the digital, augmented, or virtual reality. Virtual reality technology intensifies the digital world while augmented reality technology erases the boundaries between the worlds. The game, um, for those of you who are gamers, uh, there's a game called Pokemon Go, which gathered more than 100 million users all over the world over a very short period of time. And this has demonstrated the possibilities of augmented reality and the readiness to apply this kind of technology. Augmented reality is already applied at the workplace in complex productions, forming new ways of work, communication, uh, and cooperation within uh, a business. I think a very good example here would be uh, simulators that are used to train um, uh, staff or employees, particularly in the aerospace um, uh, industry vertical, where before you allow somebody to go and handle a multi-million or multi-billion dollar um, piece of equipment, you've got to take them through as many of the scenarios that you can replicate before they actually get in, um, into, into, actual, uh, uh, into the actual workspace. So it is beginning to happen. We are beginning to see it. We are beginning to see more and more of these technologies being applied in a real life um, uh, scenarios. Now, I spoke earlier on about um, the number of devices that are interconnected and um, how all of these devices are continuously picking up data and feeding it um, into some sort of database. So the simplest bio interfaces um, that we see, such as smartwatches and electronic sports-based bracelets, have already become a common phenomenon in our everyday lives. We see this, we see people wearing them. Um, they enable us to quickly analyze and transmit information about our own condition, heart rate monitors. They're also measuring um, 
the number of steps and how much energy you're you are um, you're using in whatever physical activity that you're doing. Uh, you've got some that are now measuring um, your your blood pressure. The continuation of this technology package will be implantable sensors transmitting data on the state of the organis organism, for example, on sugar levels, hormones, and organ function to a personal smartphone or to the treating doctor. I touched briefly, very briefly earlier on about the, um, the life expectancy and how it is, you know, people are living a lot longer than they did before. And you can start seeing how this is possible because if you're monitoring some of these aspects that impact on um, the quality of human life and also life expectancy, and you're able to take corrective action, the moment you see a problem beginning to emerge, you will start seeing that, yes, you know, these technologies are now also impacting on the human side of life. And with this, the question is really, where do we go from here? You know, what is the next frontier um, in the bio interfaces? And there's already discussions around this. Uh, in 2017, um, Elon Musk declared the creation of the Neuralink company. And essentially, this company will be working on the creation um, of a fully fledged brain computer interface. So put simply, what this means is that um, the rapid development of this uh, initiative can begin after the completion of uh, you know, the mapping or the decoding of brain work by analogy with the biotechnical revolution that started after decoding of the human um, genome. So what it means is that now you're actually going to have a device that is connected um, to your brain and being able to map that. There is possible discussion. There is discussion around, you know, where this is going from a, from a moral standpoint, but this is what the technology is, is, is investigating. Another key element of what's happening in the workspace is relates to automation. Automation has been around for a um, number of years, uh, and we have seen this um, particularly towards the end of the 20th century, you know, and this has led numerous researchers have expressed their opinions on the process of automation. And this goes as far back as people like Karl Marx, um, and uh, G. Alshia. In the interpretations, they tried to conceptualize relations between humans and technology and to comprehend our mutual roles in the present and foreseeable future. What we're seeing today um, is the acceleration of this trend, which is connected to the expansion of automated control technologies and the production of material and digital products. We are talking not only about the development of robots designed to carry out various physical tasks, but also about the significant automation of routine cognitive work through the expansion um, of systems of weak artificial intelligence. So again, what we are beginning to see is we're now going beyond the automation of a production system which is if you walk into a factory, there is a machine that does the assembly, it puts it on a conveyor, the conveyor moves it from one workstation to the next until it gets to the packaging. We're now going to start seeing a little bit more thought and with robots being able to do uh, more, um, more tasks, which would normally have been done by human beings where a little bit of thought is required. So that is, where this is going. And this will lead to the new industrial era. And um, the transition to the new industrial model will implies not just an automation of um, separate conveyor lines of production where separate devices act independently from each other, but rather a creation of complex production systems connecting physical and digital spaces. Several compound elements lie at the base of the new industrial model. Right. And 
Uh, this is buttressed by the development of industrial robotics, which will allow for the replacement of manual labor in the majority of routine production operations. The expansion of driverless vehicles will change logistics um, at the individual company level, as well as on a larger scale. And you're already beginning to see how connected all of this is, where you're going online, you're doing your shopping, that information is immediately transferred to a warehouse where um, machines will unpack that from um, uh, the warehouse and put it where it can be put into a delivery van and then couriered and you will get that. Now, a lot of those tasks are already have been um, taken over by machines and we will see more and more of it where even the trucks and the vehicles um, that do the deliveries will also be automated. Now, with all of this happening, where do we see, um, what, where is the cutting edge of some of this technology? And um, automakers particularly are working on building various self-managing systems. Significant fame was gained, gained by the robot pilot of Tesla, which is already able to park, maintain its, feet, its speed, traffic lane, and distance between cars, as well as switch between lanes on the road. And this is real. This is already happening right now. The introduction of the driverless vehicles will rest on technological and legislate, legislative barriers, but many automakers have now jumped onto the bandwagon and are beginning to do their own developments. And within this period, between 2020 and 2030, we will see a lot more of these automated vehicles. This will significantly change our attitude towards cars and call into question the existence of the taxi driver professionally, as an example. Robot piloting is not limited to cars on the road. Different producers of agricultural machinery have already been incorporating some of this. So you're starting to see it across sectors now. For example, um, John Deere tractors are capable of independently excavating a field based on a pre-programmed route. Now, all you do is you go to a machine, you punch in um, your pre-programmed route and away um, the tractor goes with automatic fertilizer delivery systems, right? Which make a decision based on sensors that analyze a whole range of information from the weather to the coefficient of light reflecting um, on vegetables and patches. In addition to a robot pilot for cars, a rapid development of unmanned aerial vehicles is also taking place. Amazon's online store is already testing the delivery of goods with the help of self-managing drones. The inevitable introduction of self-controlled self systems for trucks and forklift trucks is going to fundamentally change the logistics sector. The whole process of loading and transporting uh, materials between factories, as well as delivering goods to the sales outlet can be fully automated. So robot piloting means not just substituting a driver behind the car steering wheel. It is the development of capabilities of artificial intelligence to analyze complex flows of incoming information, data that we spoke about, the big data, and independently making efficient decisions. And this is where the machine learning aspect comes in as these scenarios will always be different. So it's gotta be able to cope with the differences and still be able to recognize a pattern. This kind of skill will enable the automation of a significant portion of physical activity. So having said that, I'd like to hand you over back to Kyle to take you through um, the next, um, the next uh, few slides, which will continue in term with, which will continue in unpacking what the hybrid workplace will look like. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for that, Taffy. Um, sorry, guys, I'm having some technical difficulties. So, um, I'm going to ask uh, somebody to um, start with the slides, that's okay. But I think those trends are so important, especially how 
we see that artificial intelligence and technology has really emerged so much um, and how we actually need to transform in our organizations. Um, but at the same time, start looking of how does the future look like? Um, so what we do know is that, you know, globalization um, has really become a reality a long time ago. And um, in most countries, um, you know, you can ba basically buy, you know, proper clothing or electronic uh, brands and eat in famous fast food restaurants, essentially. Um, you know, let's look at McDonald's, KFC and Starbucks, for examples. You know, they are, they're seen as, or they're perceived as what we call primary symbols of globalization. And the value chain of many goods have already transcended national barriers. It is increasingly difficult to tell exactly where a certain product was produced since, um, you know, different parts might have been produced in different areas of the world, um, but it's sort of on the very top of the globalization iceberg. Now, you know, if you, if you look on the next slide, you'll see we talk about um, Nutella and the chain of pr production and sales uh, of even such a sort of seemingly simple product as a chocolate spread. Um, for example, you know, Nutella covers the whole globe. You can find it in almost every country. However, the raw products are supplied from Brazil, Turkey, the USA, uh, Malaysia, and some African countries. And production sites are located in Canada, Australia, Brazil, and seven pla uh, several places in Europe, while their sales offices can be found in almost every country. However, regardless of where we are in the continent or in the globe, the, or, or chocolate spread is produced, its taste will always remain the same, no matter where you buy it from. Another great example um, that I'm going to share with you now um, is around um, an aeroplane. So, you know, almost any complex product involves a chain of manufacturers from dozens of countries. Um, and as an example, um, you know, let's look at this 787 Dreamliner, for example. So for its production, competent manufacturers are involved from all over the world. Now, this sort of diagram helps us to demonstrate the various details of the vehicle that are produced both in the America, Europe, and Asia. Now, global suppliers of Boeing are full partners, and they actually invest, they invest in their resources in what we call the development of components of the aircraft, which the expectation of sharing revenue, revenues with the American corporation in the future. Now, at the same time, while we're looking at sort of the planning of this, um, we look at the production, which takes sometimes about 25 to 30 years to complete. Now, connectivity of the companies is available around the world, meaning that there's not only you know, one synchronization of the business process and technology st uh, standards, but also there's similar requirements of personnel in different countries. Now, one of the key requirements that global companies seek in potential of employees is the ability to actually interact across culture, which is such a big thing now. And you'll see, if we look at the next slide, we'll see that in the middle of the 20th century, the center of the global economic activity switched from Europe to North America. Now, since the Second World War, the USA has significantly outperformed European countries in GDP. What we do see, however, nowadays is that the economic role of the USA and the EU is declining. And the center of the world activity is gradually shifting to Asia. And by 2030, developing economies will account for more than two thirds of the global growth and most of their trade. Now, these countries of Southeast Asia will actually become flagships of the global economy, primarily China and India. It is expected that in addition to an increase in economic activity in the region, there will also be an increase in activity in the field of knowledge creation and technological innovations. If you look at the next slide, you'll see that China already ranks second in terms of research and development cost amongst all countries. Only second is the USA. 
Now, the change in the balance of power in the economic and technological environment will also have an impact on the global market that we see ourselves in. Now, transactional corporations are able to transfer their activities from one country to another in a very short time. But this spurs development in territories where there's new activity in rapidly expanding. However, at the same time, there's a threat to those places that have to deal with massive decrease in labor op opportunities due to the fact that the number of jobs are diminishing. Now, the most obvious changes are happening in the field of the power of engineering. And we've seen now the rise of what we call the green ecosystem. And until recently, coal and gas uh, sort of dominated the market, while investments in sort of the solar and wind power were mainly focused on research and development of the effective technology, the technological solutions. But over the last de decade, the situation has changed drastically. Um, can you just, yeah, there we go. Thanks, Taffy. Um, so in 2016, we see that the World Economic Forum repeat, uh, reported on the accomplishment of a historical moment when the cost of renewable energy uh, became equal to the cost of um, traditional energy in 30 countries of the world. Now, I I'd like to show you some stats on the next slide. So if you can just go on there for me, it says that we see that, you know, most of our electricity is still produced by coal and gas. Um, many of us are experiencing load shedding at the moment, but alternative energy has already been surpassing traditional energy sources for several years in other countries besides ours. Now, we know that China conf confidently holds the leading position in, both in terms of volume of established capacity as well as sort of new power plants. The same trend um, appears in the field of the motor car production, uh, where for many years, battery operated cars have not been taken seriously. In 2008, Tesla introduced the Roadster model, which drastically changed the perception of possibilities for battery operated cars. Now, currently the majority of prominent car manufacturers are realizing uh, or actually preparing to sort of release their models of battery operated cars. Now, according to sort of Bloman, uh, Bloberg and his research predictions, we're saying that by 2040, the majority of buyers will purchase cars operating with electricity. Many countries are pursuing a gradual policy of eliminating disposable plastic by imposing taxes and even prohibiting the com uh, prohibiting plastic completely. Now, um, you know, we've seen some countries that are prohibiting plastic, countries like Bangladesh, China, France, uh, we've got countries in North Africa that is also uh, banning plastics, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and so forth. So we're seeing sort of this drive for renewable energy in what we're doing. So if you look at the next side, we see that you know, with biomimicry um, and, and, and how it looks. So our, our, as our understanding of sort of the possibilities of the environmental uh, methods in the, I wanna say urban development or production deepens, so does our, our green thinking, okay? Now, biomimicry is the science of applying nature-inspired de um, designs in human engineering and innovation to solve human problems. Now, it was used to create the first flying machine inspired by eagles and owls, and this paved the way for technologies like jets and planes. It was also used um, in the invention of uh, Velcro, which works much the same way as the hooks on burrs when they stick um, to, a, an, to animal fur. A fur. Now, by designing and producing materials, architecture, and systems that are based on biological materials and processes, we work to strike a balance with nature. So with this, we live in harmony with Mother Earth and not to continue producing sort of global problems. Now, 
Um, biomimicry is propelling us towards the new way of living, uh, living to sustainable assets, methods, and policies. And aside from the reasons only involving the desire to be environmental friendly, businesses have other in incentives to actually utilize biomimicry products and processes. Um, you know, generally applying biomimicry allows us to do more with less. So it gives us more production and more profit with less work and less cost. It is quite obvious that the ability to rethink ecosystematically and build processes according to principles of biomimicry is becoming a necessary skill for all of us across all sectors to start looking and transforming into to sort of help develop the economy. And with that said, I'm now going to hand you over back to Taffy. Uh, thank you, Carl. So I think um, to all our guests, what uh, you will have seen um, over the last couple of slides is certain trends um, of what is happening in the worst workspace. And I think we, we must be in tune to those changes. We must prepare ourselves for um, what is um, coming so that you know, we, we, we are not, we're not found wanting. But I think the greatest impact for me is uh, when we look at um, uh, the trends and technology and what is happening, has to be what is, you know, the impact that all of this has, particularly on the social aspect um, of our lives. Now, the speed of demographic changes that mankind has faced over the last century has been unprecedented um, in the history of mankind. Life expectancy, which I've spoken about earlier, which has already reached impressive figures and continues to increase in many countries of the world, Urbanization remains one of the key factors in determining um, demographic tendencies. It largely supports the changing role of women and children in the economy and in society. So no longer are women um, just confined to their roles in the home, at home, and they're now actively contributing and to a, to a great extent in, in the workplace as well. Now, According to the UN forecasts, um, the average global life expectancy in 2050 will increase to 76 years. These calculations are based on assumptions that the growth rate of life expectancy in developed countries will slow down. Some researchers point out that the modern medical technology will allow us to maintain the current life expectancy growth rate. According to the predictions of Open and Volpo, um, a number of uh, OECD countries will overcome the 100-year threshold for average life expectancy at birth by 2050, 100 years. However, it's not just about increasing life expectancy, but also about extending the period of active life um, of those individuals. So if you're retiring at 60 or 65 and you're living to be 100, you still have significant portion of your life where you're not really actively um, contributing um, to the economy in any, in, in any particular way. In OECD countries, people aged 60 or older are no longer limited to a quiet pension, but rather they want to live their life to the fullest. The growth of the portion of the population that is aging compared to with the decline in the portion of young people creates a number of economic problems in developed countries because it is becoming increasingly difficult to finance pensions um, for the growing percentage of elderly people. I think one of the most uh, telling features of this was at the start of the pandemic, um, particularly in Europe, um, of the COVID pandemic, countries like Italy and Spain were hit very, very hard. And that was mainly to do with the fact that they had an aging population um, and they were more susceptible to the, to, to, to the virus. So this will um, lead to an increase in retirement age while the income level of pensioners will decrease. That is one aspect. 
The other aspect that I want to touch on is the evolving role of women and children. And um, this keeps changing in the economy. Generally, one can talk about the transition from housekeeping to active participation in the labor market. In most of the OECD countries, attention is focused on women having an equal opportunity to occupy managerial positions and receive equal wages for the same work. Fair enough. Um, in many countries of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, women are only just starting to fully uh, participate in the labor market. And they're now having to fight the same battles that um, in the more developed, uh, economically developed nations have had to fight, which you know, is the equal, equal pay for, for equal work. While in some countries, this participation is still limited. According to the report, uh, to the report of the International Labor Organization, urbanization and other social changes will lead to a significant increase in the share of women in the labor market in developing countries. Children are growing up in a rapidly changing environment um, and a changing world that is not understood by adults themselves. Uh, half the time I'm asking my, uh, my kid to help me with the TV or some other device which they understand better. It is increasingly difficult to talk about a separate period of preparation for adulthood, since in most phases of life, it will be necessary to constantly learn and relearn. The new generation ends up in a winning position, since for most of them, technology becomes, is a familiar part of the world in which they were born. This enables them to influence the market by creating demand or even becoming co-creators of the digital world. Uh, jobs like programmers, video bloggers, gamers. They're, they're new types of work that probably didn't exist a decade ago, even before they finished school. The blurring of childhood boundaries is taking place. Previous patterns are no longer suitable for describing this period, while new ones have not yet been formed. Now, we've, it's, it's, it's like we've almost just digressed just to unpack um, these, these trends. But um, I think we need to try and bring it back into the topic that we are talking about and what is the impact on the workplace. So the increase in the number of people age 60 or older who continue working in their professional niche, creating tension for a new generation of workers. I think um, for a lot of us, and I would love for some of you to share your experiences in the chat. If you do have some friction that's caused between older generation and newer generation. There's always bound to be that kind of friction. And um, I think the challenge in terms of trying to manage a hybrid workplace is how do we manage that? There's also the creation of uh, demand for new services, including training in new skills by people who continue to live actively at the age of 60 and above. The increase in the share of working women in countries where parity has not yet been achieved and the equalization of wages in countries where women are already actively involved in the labor market. And I think this has um, a multiplier effect even on the, on, the, on the economy at large. More people are working means um, there's more money available to spend within the greater economy. The increasing increasing independent role of children in the digital economy as both consumers and participants in the labor market. The growth in demand for specialists who understand characteristics of the older and younger generation in all areas of the economy. So I think it's important to just dwell on this fact just for a moment in that it will become critical particularly for people in supervisory and management positions to be able to manage across the different generations because it is going to be a skill set that will need to be learned because it is the reality that we are facing. The need for intergenerational communication skills, not only when working with clients, but also when building relationships with colleagues. In the very near future, there will be teams in which people under the age of 80 and or older than 80 will work together and collaborate. That should be fun. 
the final demolition of boundaries between the lifetime um, between the lifetime periods, uh, preparation, work, pension, because of demographic changes, which will also lead to the universal recognition of the need to learn and relearn throughout life. So my view and my opinion is that this, this preparation work, maybe not pension, but will continuously go on because the, the period uh, the rate of change is going much, much faster. So you're going to have to learn and unlearn certain things as the technology moves. So it's going to be critical to be able to um, understand those boundaries and be intuitive enough to be able to jump on new trends and learn new things um, so that you remain relevant in the workspace. Another aspect that I really want us to just spend a little bit of time is we've spoken about it in bits and pieces, I think earlier on uh, in the presentation, where we've spoken about the network um, society. And this term was suggested in the 90s by European sociologists, um, Jan van Dijk and Manuel Castellas. They predicted that the expansion of network communication technology will radically change the structure of society and each individual's lifestyle. In OECD countries, more than 80% of the population is already connected to the global network. And in countries where this indicator is lower, there is a steady growth of users. We are witnessing the expansion of new network culture, which manifests itself in the changing attitude of people towards work, consumption, leisure, and other aspects of life. These changes are accompanied by technological progress, which simplifies distributed resource management and enables us to move away from the usual hierarchical administration systems. So in a world that's connected by networks, the need to go to an office, follow a consistent schedule and work for one organization is gradually vanishing. More and more people are becoming freelancers, all sorts of labor markets from programmers and copywriters to plumbers and nannies enable direct connection, contact between the customer and the performer. I think there's a term that's going around now, which is um, the gig economy, where you get one gig and move on to the next. The feedback system helps to bring trusting relationships and virtually eliminates the need for centralized re re regulation. The rapid expansion of the sharing economy reflects the ideas of the network society. Consumers want to use specific products only when they need them and are not willing to own them for the rest of, um, of time. This way they reduce ecological footprint and reduce the cost of maintaining the property. The most apparent breakthrough has already occurred owing to the expansion of car sharing services. Car sharing can be seen in the majority of big cities in the world. And this eliminates in the more developed economies where they have very efficient um, public transport systems to complement these car sharing um, uh, uh, teams or communities, uh, you know, will lead to less of an impact on the environment as well. So the development of driverless vehicles will increase the convenience of such programs. Since a car can drive right up to the location by itself at any moment, you jump in, um, it takes you to, the, to your destination and you jump out and somebody else um, gets in and so on and so forth. So this will invariably lead to a new approach to business. So agile, agile management is the approach that involves uh, flexible project management to create functioning products using a series of prototypes. It is based on the free co-authorship of participants um, in the process. This approach originated in the field of development of IT products, but it eventually became applicable beyond the IT field. Um, so businesses will need to be able to adapt and to be able to, um, to manage uh, projects, particularly in short iterations so that they can change and pivot um, as quickly. Holacracy is an organization management system in which authority is distributed over a network of self-optimizing teams. 
The main focus is on creating common rules, identifying individual roles, organizing small teams, and building interaction between them. And then there's the turquoise organization. And this approach is based on the premise that organizations are capable of evolving into self-managed structures. There are going to be a lot of old school managers that will struggle with some of these concepts. These new organizations fulfill their global missions and each employee invests in it as much as he or she can. Old hierarchical systems will find it hard to survive in a network society. They, are, they will be replaced by new forms of communities and teams based on the integration of local experience, global vision, and integrated approaches to activities that unite creative, um, that unite creative and work endeavors. In the corporate sector, this trend manifests itself in the expansion of new management schemes. So the workplace will change, it will have to adapt. And if you stick to your old hierarchical management systems, yeah, um, as Kyle mentioned right at the beginning, we could be talking about quite a few codecs um, in the next couple of years. New organizations and communities emerge as a network of interconnected individuals and small groups, creating an environment for the full realization of an individual. External motivation in the form of bonuses and career growth allows for the development of internal motivation to create and implement joint large scale projects for the benefit of society. Um, at this point, I would like to um, get Kyle to speak to us about, um, to speak to you about the meta trend. Um, thanks, Kyle. Take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Taffy. And um, if you can just help me navigate through the next slide, that would be great. Um, you know, we've looked at these trends and, um, you know, the meta trend might sort of be familiar to us because what we've seen is the acceleration of technology and social uh, changes. And, and that's sort of what the meta trend appears is that in all the key trends that we've described um, through the session, you know, the world is not just changing, it's changing at such an increasing rate. And the acceleration of the rate of technology growth is clearly visible when we compare it to the speed of expansion of new technologies in the 20th and 21st centuries. And while we need decades for mastering sort of electricity since innovation, um, and funny enough, talking about it, we're all sitting with load shedding right now, we see that there's widespread distribution of smartphones in developed countries, and it only took a few years. And I mean, if you look at the, the research um, by uh, Granta in two, uh, 2021, um, you know, we've seen how long it's taken us, um, you know, to still get electricity right. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of the development and the research around telephone and radio and television. Um, and then we start seeing things where, you know, PCs were developed quickly, mobile phones were developed quickly, the web came out so quick that it hit us by speed. Um, you know, uh, the other day we were having a conversation at work and I see one of them is here in attendee. And um, we were talking about how uh, we were talking to some of the graduates that came into our business. And we were asking him, do you know what a floppy disk is? Um, and I hope many of you know what it is, but if you don't, it was one of the first sort of USB drives that I was um, known to have. Uh, and it was a little disk that you plug into a PC or you push it into a PC and it sort of spins. And, and that was, um, you know, our USB or our hard drive or, and where we stored um, information. And, um, you know, it was so funny because some of them never knew what that was. Um, and then, you know, when we when there was the evolution of the CD-ROM, for example, we all thought we were cool. And I don't know how many of you, but I used to then sort of burn my own CDs. Um, and, and then that got us talking about how the evolution of, um, you know, cassettes or records to cassettes to CDs to now iTunes and, and um, you know, Spotify and all of those things that we have. So 
you know, we see how technology has sort of infiltrated this market. We see how you can literally do things at the, the, the sort of the touch of your phone. I mean, um, you know, for example, right now I got disconnected uh, with my PC because of my electricity and it didn't come on and I'm using my phone by presenting this to you. So it's amazing how we see that there's development, especially in the first world countries and how things are moving. I mean, there's self-driving cars that Chaffee mentioned and all of these wonderful techno-driven aspects that are coming into our sphere. And what we need to do is we need to start embracing this and we need to start engaging with this and learning about it because this is the future. Um, and if we're not going to embrace it, we're just gonna lag behind. Um, Jeffy, if you can help me move to the next slide, because what I really want to talk about here is sort of the economy of the future. And we are really, really facing some significant changes. Um, and, and, you know, I've picked out sort of the growing and uh, stagnant segments. And I just want to go through with you um, on them because it's, it's so important because we exist in a world of complex systems. And every day, we are in, they, they're increasing in their, in their complexity. Now, if we look at the sort of growing segments, we see that, you know, um, autonomous cyber physical production is there. There's, um, you know, definitely driveless vehicles. And we've seen, um, you know, Tesla doing uh, things like that. We've seen total connectedness. We've seen hybrid. That's a, a reality. Uh, I mean, just the other day, I was reading about, um, you know, one of these multinationals, Deloitte, where they are allowing employees to work from anywhere, okay? And, and that's what hybrid is there about. And we've seen, you know, horizontal structures of managers and uh, of management in, in organizations. And we've seen a lot of companies adapt through that with COVID. You know, there's no more this hierarchical sort of organograms in organizations. Companies are moving more to flat-based structures, uh, where there's room for development through uh, training and growth in terms of responsibility, but not just about title anymore. You know, we, we, we're seeing sort of, um, you know, highly personalized services in terms of healthcare and sports industries. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you know, but like 3D printing, you know, we're using 3D printing for teeth now. You know, you don't need to go um, to the dentist and he needs to take a fitting and and then he sends it off to the person. I don't know what you call them, but they make those teeth for you and they pull them up and they send them back and then you got to go for a fitting. And, and that's a process. All right. Um, now you can go into a dentist room. He will scan your mouth for you. He will take the measurements of your teeth that you need and they will print it in a matter of 30 minutes and implant that back into your mouth. So whereas we would wait weeks for this stuff to come through, we're now getting it in the matter of minutes in our fingertips. But what we see is that in terms of the stagnant um, uh, segments, we see that manual labor in most manufacturing and sort of uh, numerous services in terms of operations, they are still there. Okay, we're seeing that the centralization of infrastructure management and development, there's certain things, um, you know, that we still need development on. And those things are stagnant and we need to push them forward. You know, cities and, 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 and centers of mass industrial production, as an example. Um, you know, if we look at the city centers 10, 15 years ago and how buzzing it was and how everybody wanted to go into the city center or town, because uh, that's the only place you could get things done. Um, you know, now you don't need to go there. We're looking at sort of, um, you know, routine intellectual work and mediation, things like employment and sales, marketing, logistics, finance, IT, for example. All of those things are there. We're looking at large industrial plants as large employers. Um, you know, we've seen mm -hmm. how um, big industries that have come to South Africa and sort of put, um, you know, manual um, sort of production lines like Ford, for example, um, the other day I was chatting to someone from Isuzu who's implemented this new program in the in PE um, and they were busy developing this, but that's all manual labor and those there's still things that are stagnant. And you know, sometimes we as humans we get afraid of you know this fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, well, there's robots coming and there's automation and will I still have a job and so forth? And you know, 
it's it's things like that. If we don't adapt and start learning and embracing these new these these new sort of spheres that we're in, we're gonna lag behind. And you know, we mentioned this Kodak story so often, and and that's true because you know Kodak was one of the places that was renowned in the world. It was one of the best companies at one point because. Um, you know, it was d- uh, printing of uh, pictures and photography and so forth, but they did not evolve as the world was evolving. They did not embrace technology. Um, you know, if Kodak at that point were market leaders, they could have, you know, developed Instagram, for example, or, or stuff, like that, but they have not. And we've seen how technology has pushed all those things aside. And now we've got digital. I mean, I don't know when last I even printed a picture or heard of someone uh, printing a picture, but We've seen that in this pandemic and what it has taught us is that companies need to evolve. And if we're not going to evolve, we're going to start lagging behind and we're going to see, um, you know, young new companies coming up that is embracing technology, overtaking us and capturing the market. Um, And that is why, you know, a lot of big companies invest in research and development and strategic departments and so forth, because that's what it's about. It's really about how do we innovate? How do we keep up to date with the trends? How do we make sure that our company and our organizations are still going to be in existence um, going forward? So while technology is there, it's important to remember that technology is never going to replace that human touch, all right? We're still going to need humans at some point in some form in some area of this operation. Um, You know, it's not like we're going to have robotics and, you know, humans are now going to be extinct. I don't think that will ever happen. What I do think is that as humans, we need to stop being smart. We need to need to stop being smart about the choices that we are making. Um, You know, as we study, as we move through, what are we looking at? You know, um, are we looking at more of changing the working environment and understanding the skills or are we still learning stuff, um, you know, from... 1996 as an example and, and, and some of those you know it, it's we need to start engineering ourselves in a better way more forward i mean a perfect example every single one of us right now is affected by load chain um it's a reality in south africa and and so forth but as an organ as organizations within south africa we need to maybe as look the, as this as an opportunity uh, in terms of you know how do we use um, renewable energy. I mean, we're surrounded by the ocean. How do we use those ocean currents to produce um, energy? We we have, you know, um, certain places that experience, for example, more wind than other cities. How do we use that wind energy, um, you know, through this? I mean, we were learning about windmills when we were in school. You know, now it's, we should be having them because it, it gives us that source of energy. But what it needs to be, it starts with us. And I mean, we can point fingers and we can play the blame game and so forth, but it starts with us as organizations. It starts with that idea of how do we want to move this forward? How do we want to get there? Um, you know, do we have the right mindset? Do we need to upskill ourselves? Do we need to learn and so forth? So I'm not going to bore you too much around this, but that's the complex world that we are living in. That's the challenges that, that we are actually facing. Um, and we need to look at how do we, how do we move past this? Um, if you can just help me with the next slide, Taffy. So the thing that we do know is that the economy of the future is going to face some significant changes. I mean, we've just spoken about them. Um, you know, I, I've looked at this sort of um, um, complex system, if you want to call it um, that. And, and, and we see that there's external problems that move into the complexity of technology and institutions, and they help us with internal problems. And, and, and that wheel goes back because what happens is that as, you know, sometimes we are decreasing uh, our external problems, we could be increasing our internal problems, okay, and vice versa. And we need to understand that how do we use technology that will benefit us? How do we use aspects of technology um, that can help us be better and, and help our employees um, you know, there's a company um, that I know of in South Africa. It's a very big company. And what they do is their rewards system in their company is based on their employees' search history on their PCs. So what they do is they track their PC, uh, their, their employees' search history. 
And they go through this, um, you know, obviously with uh, robotics and all of those sorts of things. But what they do is they've developed reward systems that is specific and tailor-made to the employees. So they're able to see that their employees are now shopping a lot on take a lot, for example. So part of their rewards and recognition program is they will now start offering take a lot vouchers. Uh, or if they see that you know a lot of the employees are buying a specific meal, um, they will then start offering vouchers for that restaurant or for that meal. So what they're doing is they're taking data that they have, which primarily was an external problem in terms of rewarding employees. And, and we know this because people are o- always want to be rewarded and recognized. There's different motives to be rewarded and recognized. And, and many of you studying will understand that. But what they've done is they've taken this external problem and actually solved it internally within the organization. And by doing that, they've seen the employee engagement increase by up to 82% in the organization. And part of that employee employee engagement survey, the feedback that comes back to the, the management is that my company cares for me because they know exactly what I need. So they've picked up trends that towards the 20th and the 25th of the month, employees are no longer on take a lot. What they are doing is trying to buy electricity or they're trying to buy airtime, or they're going on, how how do I make this work? How do I make it to a month end? So during that time, they start giving electricity vouchers or airtime vouchers, because what they're doing is they're sustaining the the system in which they're working. They're giving the employees an experience through the technological data that they have found from the employees. And this is really, really good. And we see this now being adapted to a lot of other companies, but this company has really done well through this because even their um, sort of um, termination rate um, has dropped uh, significantly, right? Um, so, so that's sort of how the future is looking. And I'm gonna end off with the next slide because w- what we see here is sort of the future of hybrid. And, and if we look at this, we see that, you know, take it, you know, if we look at some of these trends, you know, um, there will be no professions for w- which skills are acquired at a young age in the future um, that are not retained. So basically what we're saying is, you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you, um, you know, when, as growing up, you know, we, we've picked certain careers, but those career choices have changed drastically. You know, people are now looking into data science and, 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 and business intelligence and so forth, rather than going into teaching and doctors and, and, so, and so forth. We know that there will be no simple uh, meaning and execution of routine operations on a conveyor. What we do know is that there will be many new occupations for which there is still no name, which will be constantly changing. And and we're going to hear from some of the industry experts tomorrow where we're going to be discussing how has recruitment changed? What are some of um, you know the changes that we've seen in the job market and and jobs that are hopefully um, you know going to evolve with technology? We've seen that there will be no linear hierarchy. Responsibility falls on management. What we will see is that there will be work requiring turning and training in complex systems, and there will be horizontal teams working on a common goal. We, you know, there they will, they will be no routine work behind the computer when it is clear from, you know, what we find and where do we copy it to. But what we do find is that there will be jobs in virtual rea- uh, reality and augmented reality, and this will become a common phenomenon. And there will be an opportunity and even a need to combine creative and professional um, endeavors. And, and we see that, you know, taken together with all of these uh, trends that we've discussed and, 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 and the you know sort of um, scenarios that we've placed, that we are no longer bound to traditional notions of space and time to work together. Instead, we can set aside our long-held assumptions and shift our mental model to embrace this extreme flexibility that we are now facing ourselves with. And, and with that said, I'm now going to hand you back to our moderator, Samira, who will then wrap us up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think you've done such a phenomenal job with all of the, the load shedding challenges you've been experiencing device after device switched off. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you to Taffy as well for um, the really great and informative presentation. We can see from the chat box and the questions coming through that it was highly topical in nature and that um, participants seem to have really enjoyed it. Um, there were a couple of um, questions that had come through the, the chat box. If we don't have an opportunity to answer them this evening, we absolutely will answer them tomorrow in our live Q&A. We've as assembled an amazing group of panelists um, industry experts uh, to engage with you for tomorrow, but I wanted to go through um, just two questions this evening, and it was a really great question from Octavia um, around how should SMEs in the industry, in service industry, adapt to a hybrid environment in order to remain sustainable, and I think it's such a relevant question because SMEs um, contribute so significantly and they play such a critical role to reigniting South Africa's economy. Um, and they've probably been hardest hit as a result of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, I think there was a recent study that was done by McKinsey actually that basically stated that SMEs are responsible for um, at least 25% of job creation um, in South Africa. And that's quite telling, you know, because if your SMEs crumble, then, you know, your unemployment rate is going to increase even further. And what we're also seeing is with the rise in unemployment, the rate at um, the rate of job creation is so disproportionate to um, to that unemployment rate that the only way to get out of it is through to through encouraging entrepreneurship. So, I mean, one of the biggest barriers, I suppose, to SMEs is the lack of funding, the lack of operational or strategic support that you would usually find in larger organizations. Um, but I think if we were to talk about what SMEs can do, I, you know, since the, the start of the pandemic, what we've seen is huge strides being taken from a technology perspective, from a digitalization perspective, and just leveraging that technology can hugely impact positively on those SMEs in creating more efficient uh, efficiencies within uh, their limited resources. Um, and that can be the competitive advantage for those SMEs. Um, I think you know, it's also very important to create a very clear market strategy because you can't be everything to everyone, especially if you're an SME with limited resources. So having a very clear um, line of sight around who's your target market, um, what does this entail? How do you diversify your business or how do you um, create a very clear core value proposition would enable an organization or an SME to remain sustainable. Um, you know, I think also this this talk uh, this talks a little bit not just to SMEs, but one of the other questions that came through was around what happens in the increase of digitalization to that general worker or that um, unqualified worker in this hybrid model because people are currently working from home, how does it impact those individuals? And the reality is that, you know, what's most important right now is to accelerate um, the skills development conversation. How do we empower people um, to do um, to do more than what we originally needed them to do? How do we redefine or realign job roles? And what we saw at the start of the pandemic was when we were forced to work from home, there was a distribution of workload that required organizations to relook the skill sets in the organization and very quickly accelerate the skills gaps um, or addressing those skills gaps in order to um, enable people to take on responsibilities that would keep them, that would you know, enable them to survive the pandemic. So, you know, just skilling those, those workers and creating that continuous succession um, and redefining those roles would enable those individuals to remain employed. Um, so those were some really, really great questions. Um, we've had amazing, amazing engagement from you guys. I really, really want to say a massive thank you um, to all of you for attending this session. Um, I know that a lot of you have been impacted by the, the load shedding this evening. Um, I just want to reiterate a couple of things before we sign off. Um, so there were a couple of questions that came through around the presentation. The presentation will be shared with you. Um, it will be shared in your student portal um, or on your student portal. Um, there was also questions around certification. So for those of you that have missed it at the beginning of the session, um, Regent only requires your student number for certification. So if you didn't include your student number when registering for the webinar, 
just drop an email to shaquille.mohammed at region.ac.za and um, he will be able to assist you from there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of day one. Um, we really hope that you've enjoyed the session, you've, um, you've derived some value from it, and we really look forward to hosting you tomorrow. Like we've said, we've, had, we've got a really exciting panel uh, discussion lined up for tomorrow. Um, we've got industry experts that span across a multitude of disciplines, um, and you'll have, you'll have the opportunity to engage with them in that live question and answer session. So we'll take the questions that we haven't answered today into tomorrow's session, and please feel free to continue to populate those questions as the session progresses tomorrow, and we'll pose them to our guests as well. Um, have a wonderful evening, and we will see you again tomorrow. Good night.